Hi, my name is Dr. Peter Luckton, and I had a poster presentation on a solution to the body-mind problem at the Science of Consciousness Conference in Teramina this past May. On the last day of the conference, the attendees voted for the theory most likely to explain consciousness, and panpsychism tied second. It is the solution to the hard problem favored by two of the biggest names in consciousness studies, David Chalmers and Christoph Koch. The hard problem, a, a term coined by Chalmers, asks how the goings-on in the brain, the neural correlates of consciousness, or NCC, generate the qualia, or sensations and emotions, we experience. The easy problem is to find out what the NCC are. In this paper, I'll discuss challenges to the theory and why entropy provides a much better solution. Panpsychism explains consciousness by asserting that it has always existed as a psychological law of the universe, according to Chalmers. Ever since the Big Bang, photons, electrons, and other fundamental particles, plus the structures into which they assembled, have participated, even if only to a tiny degree, in the conscious experience. The idea dates back to pre-Socratic Greeks, was given its name by 16th century Italian Francesco Patrizzi, helped send Giordano Bruno to the stake, and had many prominent philosophers as adherents in the 20th century. While the human experience is exceptionally sophisticated, it is claimed that it is a continuation of a spectrum that includes other animals, plants, even rocks, and their component atoms and molecules. While the nature of the mental experience of these things isn't defined, it is asserted as certain that the solution to the hard problem is this. Consciousness does not have to be created by or emerge from our brain cells. The material and the mental realms have coexisted in their constituent atoms since the start of time. The, in the self it's, and its brain, Sir Karl Popper and Sir John Eccles criticized panpsychism for ignoring the interplay between the objective material world, Popper's world one, the subjective world of our perception and understanding, his world two, and the objective knowledge we create through our world two with others and with our surroundings, his world three. Of course, we also interact with world three in ways which are too complex to apply to anything simpler than a brain. In particular, though there may be unconscious memory, there cannot be, unconscious, there cannot be consciousness without memory. Subatomic particles have no memory and are identical regardless of their past. Furthermore, the point of consciousness is evolutionary in a Darwinian sense. Our responses to natural selection, our concerns for survival through an understanding of world one explains the evolution of consciousness and its dependence on analytical tools it constructs in world three. Popper and Eccles cite electrode experiments conducted by Wilder Penfield, which showed that an acute sense of time and place allowed our current experience to override evoked memories from the past. Time and place are meaningless to photons, which are emitted and absorbed in their time frame simultaneously, and proper times of photons and electrons experience time dilation and length contraction with respect to each other. Finally, Popper and Ecker, Eccles agreed on the importance of consciousness lying in its ability to causally direct our activity, as opposed to being an epiphenomenon. If consciousness couldn't direct our behavior, there would be no reason for it to evolve. There is no way to envisage sub subatomic particles converting their consciousness into directions the body can follow. Subatomic particles behave according to their wave functions, which determine their state and the probability of where they'll be detected. Directive behaviors are not something they seem to do. Panpsychism wins adherence as being the only theory of consciousness which skirts the problem of explaining emergence, which in itself has been considered inexplicable. No critique of panpsychism will win converts unless it satisfactorily addresses this problem. But even panpsychists still must deal with emergence, that of life from chemistry, classical physics and the arrow of time from quantum physics, 
and even simple non-causative emergent properties such as the wetness of water. Of course, the panpsychist solution to the problem of emergence is simply to say that all particles were endowed with it, without saying how or why, in much the same way as one might say God willed it. First recognized by William James in the 1890s, the binding problem is that of how individual atoms, each with a minuscule degree of consciousness, can combine these into the single extraordinary consciousness that we each experience, and indeed why it stops at the level of brains. One could imagine 332 million conscious citizens of the USA, all electronically connected by their cell phones, as indeed they are, and wonder, is the USA conscious? If not, why not? Tam Hunt and Jonathan Schooler developed the general resonance theory to solve this problem. As neurons generate trains of electric spike potentials in response to synaptic activity, and large groups of them join in cyclical patterns giving rise to brain waves of different frequencies, they generate nested resonating electromagnetic fields of different scales. Hunt and Schooler suggested the neural correlates of consciousness lie in the feelings of these fields, the dynamics of which they say have the right level of abstraction to explain consciousness and even life itself. Other neuroscientists have similar theories, for instance, John Joe McFadden's conscious electromagnetic field or information field theory without being panpsychic. But Hunt and Schooler use their theory to create shared resonances between microconscious entities that combines them into macroconscious entities. This solves the binding problem and limits them to brain activities, not the entire USA. But Hunt goes further saying that resonance theory can apply to all physical systems. And since all EM fields belong to the universal EM field, they can explain telepathy by my fields resonating with yours. McFadden, on the other hand, disagrees, stating that the resonances, the field resonances are not strong enough to escape our skulls. Erwin Schrodinger, quoted by Christoph Koch in The Feeling of Life Itself, asked of the universe before the evolution of big brains, did it remain a play before empty benches not existing for anybody thus quite properly not existing? This is like asking if the enormous space between star systems is like an environment with no ecosystems, not existing for anybody, and thus not existing. I will argue that it is all entropy's playground, a potential field for the emergence of consciousness. Living organisms are islands of reduced entropy in the universe, self-organizing structures able to assimilate energy, repair themselves, and as Schrodinger noted, persist much longer than would otherwise be expected. Upon death, their entropy rapidly increases. A hallmark of consciousness is that it also decreases our entropy, enabling us to swiftly, efficiently analyze our environment, plus entertain the emotional package needed for success in sexual reproduction, including the ability to appreciate beauty, fall in love, make babies, and be prepared to die to defend those babies. The reduction in personal entropy necessary for consciousness was a necessary precondition for the evolutionary emergence of the stupendous diversity of sexually reproducing organisms out of a sea of simple asexually reproducing organisms. The problem for panpsychism is that entropy reduction does not come for free. Conscious organisms must continuously repay their entropy debt in the form of waste heat and a net disordering of their surrounding environment. When entropy knocks on the door, we cannot say, like Wimpy, that I will gladly pay you on Tuesday for some consciousness today. This means panpsychism needs to explain how conscious sub uh, subatomic particles could alter their behavior from that determined by their wave function in such a way as to repay their entropy debt during the billion or more years they waited for planets capable of homing life to form. If there is no observable difference in the behavior of a conscious and an unconscious electron, there could be no way for the electron to repay its entropy debt, and entropy would not allow the requisite reduction 
in the electron's personal entropy. Therefore, they cannot become conscious. Ironically, entropy solves the problem of emergence that panpsychism claims to circumvent. The solution is an extension of Landauer's principle that mandates the deletion of the steps involved in the process of emergence as being necessary to satisfy a paradox concerning the law of conservation of information. Information considered as the microstate of the particles in an isolated system's macrostate can, like first law energy, be neither destroyed nor created. Yet the information in the system, like second law entropy, inevitably increases. To increase information without creating it, physicists rely on Laplace's demon, an all-knowing superintelligence that understands the full dynamics of the microstate and can predict all the future trajectories so that the increased information only rearranges things in a predictable manner. But this doesn't work for emergent phenomena, which by definition are features of a system which cannot be predicted by a complete understanding of its underlying microstate. I believe these events must be treated as irreversible computations to which Landauer's principle applies. These computations are cycles in which bits of information temporarily stored are then destroyed, representing work, heat loss, and increased entropy. Building on this, I propose the increase in entropy in a time irreversible, unpredictable emergent system requires the simultaneous deletion of information concerning the steps or computations involved. The local increase in negative entropy is balanced by positive entropy radiated away as heat. Thus, the steps sought in understanding consciousness are destroyed and will always remain a mystery. Furthermore, the conversion of thoughts into muscle action is an irreversible, unpredictable process, maybe involving electromagnetic fields, a process I call convergence. Consciousness is a tale of two demons. In breaking out of the determinist box of the law of conservation of information created by Laplace's demon, emergence would seem to create information in a manner analogous to Maxwell's demon, the, protag the protagonist in a thought experiment proposed by James Park Maxwell. This protagonist seemed to be able to violate the law of conservation of energy. He sat in a box full of air with a partition in the middle containing a small frictionless sliding door. By effortlessly opening the door at strategic moments, the demon could allow fast moving air molecules to collect on one side of the box, creating a pressure engine effortlessly able to do work. However, Landauer showed the demon was thwarted because each time it opened the door, it collected information which could not be stored indefinitely. Eventually, the information had to be erased at the end of each cycle as the demon prepared to open the door again. This wasted energy as heat, increasing the overall entropy enough to compensate for the pressure differential being generated. Similarly, in order to increase the level of order in the world uh, gained by our becoming conscious, entropy must increase through the loss of certainty associated with the process. This occurs through destruction of a portion of the information space that could be known to us, specifically that portion involved in the process of emergence itself. When Maxwell's demon opens the gate between our subconscious and our consciousness, the information that is erased is that describing the pathway of how consciousness emerges. And when we consciously decide to move muscles, an irreversible, unpredictable process of conver convergence increases entropy again. This explanation of the process of emergence has been favorably reviewed by two physics professors at time of writing. It posits consciousness and emergence in general to be the result of an accepted scientific principle, entropy, that has existed since the beginning of the universe and yet can account for the emergence of discrete, causally conscious living entities on an evolutionary basis at appropriate time points distant from the origin of the universe. Unlike panpsychism, entropy requires ongoing increases in complexity, and it is paid for. 
Unlike panpsychism, it explains why consciousness must emerge, find, and evolve. It doesn't merely answer that it's simply there as if decreed by God. Perhaps you could insist that panpsychism exists anyway, or that it exists within entropy, but the principle of Occam's razor would suggest that panpsychism is simply unnecessary. I thank the organizers of this conference for allowing me to participate, and thanks everyone for listening to this paper. The entropic theory of consciousness has many implications, including the genuine nature of reality, the impossibility of conscious AI, the impossibility of our being simulations within a conscious AI, the impossibility of our being Boltzmann's brains, and even for life after death. These are explored on my website, scholarshipoffoolsphilosophy.com. For any comments or questions, my email is pclubton at gmail.com. Um.